that Lizzo uses costs 125. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans, and I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower. And we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn and John Russell. Later, we will present our American history series, "The Making of a Nation." But first, environmentalists in Brazil's Rio de Janeiro state. Are concerned about a recent drop in population numbers of the threatened golden lion tamarin. So they have built a bridge across a busy roadway to help the monkeys move around a wider forested area. The Atlantic Forest of Rio de Janeiro State is the only place in the world where the golden lion tamarin. Still exists in the wild. Conservation efforts have increased their numbers, bringing the animals back from near total loss. But an outbreak of yellow fever disease in 2018 killed off 32 percent of the population. Today, there are an estimated 2,500. Golden lion tamarins in the wild. The environmentalists were especially fearful for a group of monkeys that had become isolated or separated from other tamarins. They became separated because of a roadway. Luis Palu Marquez Ferraz is executive director of the project that works to protect the numbers of golden lion tamarins. He told Reuters, "Scientists have shown that the population living there would be completely isolated from the other side of the road, and that would create a real problem in terms of conservation. Genetically, that population would be isolated, and that is really bad. We need a large forest protected and connected." He added. The bridge was built last year. It has been planted with trees and other plants in hopes of making a natural pathway that appeals to the tamarins. The plant life is still young and will take time to grow to a size usable for the monkeys. Fraz said that a population of two thousand golden lion tamarins should have at least twenty-five thousand hectares of forest. But the forest is broken up by open fields, roads, and towns. Conservation groups estimate that the golden lion tamarin has lost about ninety-five percent of its original environment in Brazil. That's why this bridge here was so strategic and important for the conservation program, Faraz said. Many companies are delaying plans to bring workers back to the office because of continuing concerns over the spread of the coronavirus. One big concern is the recently discovered Omicron version or variant of COVID-19. Health officials are still studying the Omicron variant. But there have been early signs that it may be less dangerous than the Delta variant. Delta is still responsible for most coronavirus cases, especially in the United States, 
and continues to cause hospitalizations. But a number of unknowns surrounding Omicron has led companies of all sizes to rethink plans to reopen their offices. Technology company Google and the nation's second largest automaker, Ford Motor Company, are among those that have once again delayed their return to office plans. Other businesses that already brought workers back are considering adding extra safety measures like requiring masks. Officials in Britain, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden also have recently asked employees to work from home if they can because of concerns about Omicron. Meta, formerly known as Facebook, and ride-sharing company Lyft recently announced they were letting workers delay their return when offices fully reopen early next year. Meta still plans to open its headquarters at the end of January, but will permit workers to delay their return to as late as June. Lyft says it will not require workers to come back to its offices through all of next year. The moves come after many big companies decided to postpone requirements for workers to return to offices in the autumn. Those decisions were largely linked to the spread of the Delta variant. Jeff Levin Schertz is with the international advisory company Willis Tower Watson. He told the Associated Press that 18 months ago, most people thought the work-from-home policies would only be in place for a short time. But the pandemic has thrown us many curves, and employers need to continue to be nimble. Willis Tower Watson carried out research involving 543 companies that employ 5.2 million workers. The research showed that on average, 34% of employees permitted to work from home remain remote. The results found that the number would drop to 27% by the first quarter of 2022. However, the research was completed before news of Omicron came out. Lawrence Gostin is a public health expert at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. He told the AP... He does not think there is enough scientific information on Omicron to support company decisions to delay their return to office plans. He said there is likely to be a continuing series of new variants as well as rises and falls in COVID-19 cases going forward. We shouldn't disrupt normal business activity at every possible trigger, Gostin said. He noted that a combination of protective measures such as face coverings, vaccinations, and ventilation methods are highly effective at preventing virus spread in the workplace. Still, the rise of new variants seems to be having a psychological effect on some business owners. Omicron has made me realize work life will never return to the way it was pre-COVID, said Gisela Gerard. She is president of Creative Civilization, an advertising agency. The company's 12 employees have been working remotely since March 2020. It made me realize how working from home is likely to keep employees 
their families and also our clients safe, Gerard said. Her company had planned to bring workers back to the office part-time in the autumn, but the Delta variant delayed those plans until early next year. Now Omicron has her reconsidering not only those plans, but also whether to bring the employees back at all. I'm Brian Lynn. Imagine you are using an Internet service to watch American films. Perhaps you decide to watch Mixtape, a movie recently made by Netflix. My gosh, this is so rad! You might ask yourself about the words you just heard. Why did the speaker say the word rad, a term that means very good or amazing, in a louder way? Why were some of the words said quietly and more quickly? In today's report, you will learn about function words in everyday speech. Let's start with a few important terms and ideas. Function words are words that have a grammatical purpose. Function words include pronouns, determiners, and conjunctions. These include words such as he, the, those, and the words and or but. Americans often reduce function words in everyday speech. In other words, they often say function words more quietly and quickly. Let's consider an example sentence. He picked up the book. The function words are he, a pronoun, and the, an article. These function words do not really give specific information. If you heard a person only say the words he, the, you would have a hard time understanding what they meant. Now let's consider the other words in the statement, the content words. Content words are words such as nouns, verbs, and adjectives. The content words in our example are the phrasal verb picked up and the noun book. He picked up the book. If the statement only had content words, it would not be a complete sentence, but it would still communicate a general idea. If our example only had content words, it would be this. Picked up. Book. The importance of content words explains why Americans often reduce function words in everyday speech. Function words have a grammatical use, but are less central to expressing specific meaning. Listen again to our example and note how the function words are said more quickly and quietly. He picked up the book. Think back to the line from the film Mixtape. The first sentence has the word gosh, a kind of expression that shows excitement or surprise. This term is said a bit louder. In the second sentence, note that the content words are spoken a bit louder as well, while the function words are said quietly and quickly. Store, a noun, and rad, an adjective, are spoken most clearly. The word so is also spoken clearly because it helps to show the speaker's strong feelings. If we took out some of the function words, the reduced statement would be, Gosh! Store! So rad! This is not a complete sentence, but it does communicate the speaker's very general idea. Note that the verb be is treated almost like a function word. In other words, the speaker does not stress the verb be. Instead of saying, this store is so rad, the speaker says something closer to, this store so rad. While Americans often stress verbs, the verb be can be a special exception. In other words, 
Americans often do not stress the verb be. The reasons behind this are complex. But one possibility is that the verb be in its present tense form does not add a lot of information. In today's report, we explored how and why function words are often reduced in everyday speech. Speakers often reduce function words because they want to draw the listener's attention to content words, the words that give the most specific meaning. The next time you listen to Americans speak, pay careful attention to how they reduce function words. With time, you will notice regular, repeated ways in which English speakers express ideas. And of course, make careful note of when speakers say function words more loudly and clearly. This act is often a clue that the speaker is making a correction or clarification. I'm John Russell. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. In the late 1800s, white Americans expanded their settlements in the western part of the country. They claimed land traditionally used by American Indians. The Indians were hunters, and they struggled to keep control of their hunting lands. The federal government supported the settlers' claims. It fought and won several wars with Indian tribes. It forced the Indians to live on government-controlled reservations. Larry West and Steve Ember tell about the people who settled on the old Indian lands after the wars. After the Indians were defeated, thousands of settlers hurried west. Some hoped to find new, rich farmland. The soil they left behind was thin and overworked. Their crops were poor. Some simply hoped to buy any kind of farmland. They did not have enough money to buy farmland in the East. Others came from other countries and hoped to build new lives in the United States. All the settlers found it easy to get land in the West. In 1862, Congress had passed the Homestead Act, this law gave every citizen and every foreigner who asked for citizenship the right to claim government land. The law said each man could have 65 hectares. If he built a home on the land and farmed it for five years, it would be his. He paid just ten dollars to record the deal. Claiming land on the Great Plains was easy. Building a farm there and working it was not so easy. The wide, flat grasslands seemed strange to men who had lived among the hills and forests of the East. Here there were few hills or trees. Without trees, settlers had no wood to build houses. Some built houses partly underground. Others built houses from blocks of earth cut out of the grassland. These houses were dark and dirty. They leaked and became muddy when it rained. There were no fences on the Great Plains, so it was hard to keep animals away from crops. Settlers in the American West 
also had a problem faced by many people in the world today. They had little fuel for heating and cooking. With few trees to cut for fuel, they collected whatever they could find. Small woody plants, dried grass, cattle and buffalo wastes. Water was hard to find, too. And although the land seemed rich, it was difficult to prepare for planting. The grass roots were thick and strong. They did not break apart easily. The weather also was a problem. Sometimes months would pass without rain, and the crops would die. Winters were bitterly cold. Most of the settlers, however, were strong people. They did not expect an easy life. And as time passed, they found solutions to most of the problems of farming on the Great Plains. Railroads were built across the West. They brought wood for homes, wood and coal for fuel. Technology solved many of the problems. New equipment was invented for digging deep wells. Better pumps were built to raise the water to the surface. Some of the pumps used windmills for power. The fence problem was solved in 1874. That was the year barbed wire was invented. The sharp metal barbs tore the skin of the men who stretched it along fence tops, but they prevented cattle from pushing over the fences and destroying crops. New farm equipment was invented. This included a plow that could break up the grassland of the plains. And farmers learned techniques for farming in dry weather. Most of the problems on the plains could be solved, but solving them cost money. A farmer could get wood to build his house but he had to buy the wood and pay the railroad to bring it west. To farm the plains, he needed barbed wire for fences and plows and other new equipment. All these things cost money, so a plains farmer had to grow crops that were in big demand. He usually put all his efforts into producing just one or two crops. The farmers of the plains did well at first. There was enough rain. Huge crops of wheat and corn were produced. Much of the grain was sold in Europe, and farmers got good prices. The farmers, however, were not satisfied. They were angry about several things. One was the high cost of sending their crops to market. The only way to transport their grain was by railroad, and railroad prices were very high for farm products, higher than for anything else. The railroads also owned the big buildings where grain was stored. Farmers had to pay to keep their grain there until it was sold. They said storage costs were too high. The farmers were angry about the high cost of borrowing money, too. They opposed the import taxes, tariffs they had to pay on foreign products. Some of the tariffs were as high as 60%. Congress had set the levels high to protect American industry from foreign competition. 
but farmers said they were the victims of this policy because it increased their costs. Farmers as individuals could do nothing to change the situation. But if they united in a group, they thought, perhaps they could influence government policy. Farmers began to unite in local, social, and cultural groups called granges. As more and more farmers joined granges, the groups began to act on economic problems. Farmers organized cooperatives to buy equipment and supplies in large amounts directly from factories. The cost of goods was lower when bought in large amounts. The Granges also began to organize for political action. Local Granges became part of the National Grange Movement. Grange supporters won control of state legislatures in a number of Middle Western states. They passed laws to limit the cost of railroad transportation and crop storage. Railroads refused to obey these laws. They fought the measures in the courts. They did not win. Finally, they appealed to the United States Supreme Court. The railroads said the laws were not constitutional because they interfered with the right of Congress to control trade between the states. The railroads said states could not control transportation costs. To do so would reduce profits for the railroad, and that would be the same as taking property from the railroad without legal approval. The Supreme Court rejected this argument. In a decision in 1876, the Supreme Court said states had a legal right to control costs of railroad transportation. It said owners of property in which the public has an interest must accept public control for the common good. The farmers seem to have won, but the powerful railroad companies continued to struggle against controls. They reduced some transportation costs, but only after long court fights. The Granges tried to get Congress to pass laws giving the federal government power to control the railroads. Congress refused to act. Many farmers lost hope that the Granges could force the railroads to make any real cuts in their costs. They began to leave the organization. Others left because the economy had improved. They no longer felt a need to protest. Within a few years, the National Grange had lost most of its members. Some local groups continued to meet, but they took no part in politics. New protest groups would be formed in a few years when farmers once again faced hard times. But for now, in the late 1870s, times were good. Most people were satisfied. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 